Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Would you stand? Happy New Year. It is so good to be in this house with you guys. Um, really looking forward to everything that the Lord has in store um, for this church, for this body, and it's just going to be a sweet year. So would you join with me in prayer as we just devote this year to him and as we worship. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for a new year. Thank you that we get to celebrate you, that we get to start with praise and with loving you and receiving your love. Father, we remember last year and just all the ways you were so faithful and so good. Help us as we go into this new one that we would have a lens of, of that same, that we would see you as good, as faithful, as loving, as true, kind, merciful, just, and gracious. It is who you are. You have never changed. And so we, we remain in that truth. We love you so much. Thank you for loving us. So we give you all the glory, all the praise, and we worship you now, Jesus. Sing, I search the world. And I search the world. But it couldn't feel me. empty praise and treasures the faith I never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied hearing your love I know it's true Oh, I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Hallelujah Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valleys and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again Nothing is better than you. Oh, 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 yes. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the
Fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out. 
every other name. Thank you for the price you paid to set us free. Thank you for your love and your grace that is always chasing after us, even when we reject you or just run further the opposite way. Thank you, Lord, that you are so kind and patient to us. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts 
that we'd be filled and refreshed with your word, that we would not walk out the same that we walked in. Lord, have your way in this time. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. today. Happy New Year. Find someone you don't know this morning. Welcome them before you have a seat. Greet them. Tell them your name. How is everyone doing today? Four of you are okay? Are you guys over here okay? You're very quiet. You guys are good? Yes? Good. Okay. Uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel Plantation, everyone. If this is your first time with us, I'm glad that it is. Uh, my name is Chris, and I get to serve here as the campus pastor. And as you will hear me say every single weekend, we are a regional campus of Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. We're one church, but we meet in many locations. Uh, and there's every once in a while, we actually go to Fort Lauderdale uh, via the video for the teaching. Today, we are staying here as we are continuing our study through the book of Matthew. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, now would be that time to take Take it out and open it up to one place, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, you want to follow along with a hard copy, just raise your hands. We've got some people coming down the aisles, and they will put a Bible in your hand so that you can follow along that way. But again, one place, Matthew chapter 3. And before we get into the word, uh, I have 74 announcements for you this morning, so get ready. Um, first, if you're a man... Raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, just, okay, just want to make sure. So this is an announcement for you. Uh, next Saturday on the 13th at 9 a.m. at our Fort Lauderdale campus, we're going to be having our men's event. We do this every single year. Guys from all the different campuses come together in one place, uh, and we just we get together for some fellowship and for some discipleship and encouragement. Uh, this is for guys of all ages. Like, you can bring your, your sons, your kids. Like, I'm going to be bringing my son to this event. Uh, we are asking that you register for this event. So if you see up there, you can scan that QR code or go onto the website. But that is going to be happening next Saturday at 9 a.m. at the Calvary Fort Lauderdale campus. Guys, hope to see you there. As we look ahead into 2024, uh, this year for us as a church, uh, we really, really want to make the most important thing the most important thing. And obviously, that's always Jesus. But, but Jesus' last command to his disciples um, was that they should go and do what? Make disciples. That is the mission of our church, that we would make disciples. And we believe that happens here three ways, by connecting people to God, that's what we're doing here today, connecting people to people, living in community, and connecting people to outreach, taking what God has done for us and, and kind of pouring it out into the community around us. Um, but this year, we want to be so focused and, and so intentional with you about your journey as a disciple. Because the, the process of discipleship is just that. It is a process. It's not a one-time event. It's not, oh, I show up on church on Sunday and kind of that's how I'm becoming a disciple. That's a part of it. But it is a journey. And it is a lifelong process. In discipleship, all it is is the process by which you and I become more and more like Jesus. And so we have been very intentional to, to make a clear pathway of discipleship for any of you that call this your home church. And so I'm gonna rattle off a few things to you. And I want you to consider and think, yeah, no, I've done that before. Um, maybe I should be in my next step in the journey, or I've never done that. I, I should do that. And so for us, the very first thing that we would hope that anyone would ever do here at the campus is our Connect Experience. Connect Experience, three-week experience that lets you know who we are as a church. Who is Calvary Chapel? What do you guys believe? Where'd you all come from? How'd you start? It also lets you share your story. And how do you find those two stories meshing together here at Calvary Chapel Plantation? Great class, three, week, three weekends. Uh, our next one kicks off on the 21st of January during this service. So child care is provided. So if you've never taken the Connect class before, uh, we encourage you to do that. But the next step in the process of, of becoming a disciple for us would be our Following Jesus class. Now, how many of you guys were here back in the day when we had Christianity 101? Anyone? 
Okay, so that's all for all of us old people. So like when I used, to, man, when I first started going to Calvary, we had all these levels of classes. I mean, at one point there was three levels of classes and you had to go like through it for like two years to get through these classes. But we're, we kind of took that away and now we're bringing it back a little bit more condensed. Uh, and, and it's a class of, of, our, of our essential doctrines. Why do we believe what we believe? What do we believe about God? What do we believe about the Trinity? What do we believe about baptism and the Holy Spirit? And so there's a series of classes that we're bringing back and that's gonna be called Father. Following Jesus. And those classes are going to launch in the spring. We're also going to be launching Freedom in the spring. Many of you guys have already gone through Freedom. That's another step. And then there's just these specific classes that we have that really focus on, on specific points in your life wherever you might find yourself. So, so uh, this uh, classes that are about to kick off in a couple weeks here at our campus, one of them is Financial Peace. How many of you guys have ever taken Financial Peace? So I don't want to say that this class like saved my marriage. But it really helped my marriage a lot because my wife grew up very differently than me. Uh, she grew up with a lot of money, and I grew up with not a lot of money. And so when we get married, she just thought that, you know, money just grows on trees and you can buy whatever you want. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. We need to budget, 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 budget. And there was a lot of strong conversation between us in the beginning. This class, once we took it, completely changed that for us. It taught us how to make a budget. Dave Ramsey is such a great communicator, told it. Husbands, how, do you, how many of you like know that sometimes someone telling your wife something that you have told her before, she'll accept it from them and not you? Anyone? Is that just me? Okay, so for whatever reason, she's like, oh, now I get it. And so financial peace is such a great class if you've never taken it, how to build a budget, how to be generous, how, you know, how, how do Christians handle their money? Great class, that's coming up for us here um, on the 17th. And then a parenting class. Parents, if you've got little ones, uh, we have three different levels of parenting classes. We're gonna be kicking it off with this first level of parenting little ones. And so that class is gonna be kicking off on the 17th. And women's ministry is gonna be having a class as well called Seek the Kingdom. Those all three things, financial peace, parenting, and women's are gonna be kicking off on January 17th. And so I wanna encourage you, if you haven't done those things before, you wanna be a part of those classes, now would be one of the only times that I would say, hey, take out your phone in the middle of church and open up your camera and scan that QR code and that will lead you to all of the things that I just told you about. So now would be that time. Take it out, open it up, get off the ESPN app, guys. Scan that. And if you got questions, we actually have a table that's set up in the hallway that can answer any questions about any of those classes, but lots and lots of opportunities for you this year to continue on this pathway of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, it is a lifelong process and we wanna be clear about it for you, amen? Amen? Announcement 64. Uh, Sunday night, tonight at 6 p.m., we're gonna be having a night of prayer in the West Building. We're gonna be praying for the Miami Dolphins. No, I'm kidding. Um, Maybe a little bit. But we just want to get the year started off right. We want to pray basically what we just saying. We want a fresh wind. We want a fresh move of God this year. We want him to pour out his spirit. So at 6 p.m., we're going to be gathering over there in the West Building. Invite you guys to come out and join us for that. I think prayer is a very important part of what we do here. And I would love to, I mean, I, I would love our prayer meetings to get so packed in the West Building that we actually have to move it in here in the sanctuary one day. That is my prayer. Uh, and so please join us tonight at 6 p.m. for prayer. Also, King's Kids. Uh, King's Kids is a ministry that we are getting ready to start here at this church. Uh, it's something that we used to do a long time ago. COVID hit, things kind of fell apart, um, but we are bringing it back. And it is a ministry that is near and dear to my heart because most of you know that me, my youngest son, Jacob, um, he has cerebral palsy, he's in a wheelchair, he has special needs. And so King's Kids is a ministry, basically like a buddy system that allows us to partner up children that have special needs with a one-on-one -on -one kind of buddy that's gonna help them get through a service and actually integrate them into our normal classrooms. And, and I know that for some of you, like, oh, that's, that's, that's really cool, and I'm excited. It wasn't until I had a child that had special needs until I realized this community of parents that sometimes just can never go to church because there just aren't ways for them to bring their kids to church and for them to be well taken care of. And sometimes parent, one parent stays home with the kid, and the other parent goes to church alone. 
King's Kids is that ministry uh, that, that allows families to come to church and worship Jesus together and know that their children that have special needs are going to be cared for in our children's ministry. So if you're like, man, that I would love to do that. I would love to be a part of that. Not just caring for those kids, but making it possible for those parents to go to church. Uh, they have a table set up right outside in the West Corridor lobby. There's a training involved in that, um, but we would love for you to join us on that team. And lastly, I swear, lastly in the way of announcements, if you have a paper Bible with you, you own it. Hold it up for me real quick. Okay. So, um, for us this year, another thing that we would love to see is uh, people owning a Bible. Now, I love technology. I love the Bible app. I think it's great. It's done wonderful things. But... There is just something about having a, a real hard copy of God's word. Um, and so we really, really want to encourage you that if you don't own a Bible, they have this brand new website. It's called Amazon. Check it out. Um, buy a Bible. There's something, and I, and I know you can take notes, and I get it, but there's, I just went back the other day and looked at my very first Bible, and I looked at all the notes that I was taking in it, the way that I underlined stuff, and the things God was speaking to me back then. There's just something about having that, and we would love for us to be a church that, that knows how to not only read the Bible, but navigate it. So if I told you right now, yeah, like, turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Some of you might know how to get there, but some of you are like, I don't even know, because I just have the app. And so we, we want to encourage you to own, to buy a Bible, and here's a really cool thing. I made this announcement last night, and, uh, and a guy from the body, a very generous guy, he sent me an email last night, and he said, hey, if there's anyone in the body who does not own a Bible, and they can't afford one for themselves, I want to buy everyone for this month a personalized study Bible. So, if that's you, and, and do not lie about not having a Bible, and you just want to get a new one, don't, don't do that, but... If you don't own a Bible, you're like, man, I, just, I can't buy a Bible right now. I've looked online at like 50, 60 bucks. We have a guy in the body who's like, I want people to have a copy of God's word in their hand. So if that's you, as you leave today, all you gotta do is go to the connection point. We'll take your information and we'll get you hooked up with a brand new personalized study Bible. Do not lie about not having a Bible. Amen? All right, let's pray before we get into God's word. Father, please, we, we need you to be with us this morning. And we know that you have given us promises that when we gather in your name, you're there. When we draw near to you, you draw near to us. That is our confidence today, that we are not here to listen to the words of a man, but to hear the words of God. God, help us to see your face today. Help us to be encouraged Help us to be challenged in the areas of our life where we need to be challenged. And help us to delight in who Jesus is as our king and that we get to follow him, to live for him. And so, Father, would you please remove distraction from this place, from our minds and our hearts? Would you give us an ability just to hear your voice, to see your face? Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is a new year, and as most people do every new year, is, is some people have resolutions. So how many of you guys have resolutions that you've made? Like you've got these goals for the year, anyone? Only three of you. Guys, set goals for your life, please. Like it's a good thing. Um, so most people, do, new year rolls around, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat better this year, I'm gonna work out more, I'm gonna read books, and those are all good things. At the heart of resolutions is this desire to change to get better in some way. It's, it's one thing, though, in life that leads to change in people, probably more than anything else, and it's when someone who has authority enters into a situation. And you're like, what do you mean by that? Well, um, I know we have some kids in here, but some of us are older, older people. Do you remember school? Do you remember being in a classroom? And you remember, like, if a teacher would, like, leave the room and leave the students to themselves for a little bit? And you remember the anarchy that would ensue? And just like, it would be madness. But, but then you would hear that like the doorknob turn. And then what would happen as soon as that authority entered into the room? Everyone sits perfect again and everyone sits up straight and everyone stops throwing stuff. And so suddenly authority is entered and change has occurred. My daughter, she works at a, at a store in the mall. And last year I can remember, she's like, I gotta go in at like 4 a.m. I'm like, what do you gotta go in at 4 a.m. for? The mall's not even open. 
well, our district manager is coming in, and we got to kind of clean up the store and make sure everything's perfect and organized. Authority was coming near, and change had to happen. I've talked to some people, and this is definitely not me, but some people I heard who speed sometimes. And you're driving, and you suddenly look in your rear view, rear view and you see a, a police car. And, and what happens as that police car kind of comes into your sight? Suddenly, seatbelt gets put on, hands at 10 and 2. You slow down. Why? Because authority is coming near. Do you see what I'm saying? And how we're designed is that the closer authority gets, it brings about change. And so, when Jesus comes near, the highest and greatest authority, the king of kings. What kind of change should that produce in us? Today, we're gonna to be introduced to a man named John. Most of you know him as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He is Jesus' cousin. And John the Baptist has a, a job and a call from God. He was a prophet, and his job was to tell people that the king was coming and to get ready for the king. That, that was his entire message. The king is coming, get ready for the king. And as we look at Matthew chapter three today, know this, that between Matthew chapter two and Matthew chapter three, there's been about 30 years. 30 year gap. We just got through celebrating Christmas and remembering when Jesus was born and then as a toddler, as the, the wise men came to see him. Now there's been 30 years and Jesus is getting ready to make his entrance into public ministry and watch how it goes down. Chapter three, verse one. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Now John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Stop right there. What kind of change should the coming near of this king bring about in our lives? The first point simply is repent from your sin, period. As the king comes near, the change that it should bring in us, repent from your sin. The king has been born in Bethlehem about 30 years prior, and now as he gets ready to make his entrance, well, you might think that there would be a parade. As I was studying this, I'm, my mind is just filled with Disney movies from when my kids were growing up. But you ever see Aladdin? Anyone ever see Aladdin? Okay, really? That's it? Okay, well, anyway, Aladdin makes a wish to become a prince and so that he can marry the princess. And as he becomes a prince and he makes his grand entrance, there's this big song. You guys know the song? Do you want me to sing it? I'm not gonna do it, anyway. But that's where my mind, there's like this big parade and elephants, hey, clear the way in the old bazaar, like that kind of thing. So like, that's where my mind goes. Like, this is the entrance of a king, but that's not what we see for Jesus. There is no parade, there is no trumpets, there is no well-dressed herald announcing the king. There is just John, a messenger from God who didn't look like your typical messenger from God. Not dressed in linen or silk, but in camel's hair. Any of you guys have a nice camel's hair suit at home? No. It was rough. It was crude. It was cheap. He's living out in the wilderness all alone. He, he eats locusts and wild honey. I mean, he looks like a crazy person. Like, I gotta tell you, if, if for whatever reason I came up here today and said, hey guys, we got a special guest speaker, a guy I know, his name is John. John, come on up here. And if, and if John the Baptist came up here today looking like how he looked, y'all would think he's a crazy person. You'd call security. But this is John. And what I love about John, he's probably one of my favorite people in the Bible, John just really didn't care what people thought about him. He wasn't interested in trying to impress anyone with his appearance because he knew that the, the messenger wasn't really the important thing, the messages. And so he comes out of the wilderness, looking how he looks. 
And in the very same way that he wasn't trying to impress anyone with how he looked, he certainly wasn't trying to impress anyone with his message. What you need to understand is that there has been 400 years of silence from God at this point. The last time God spoke to his people, it was 400 years prior through a prophet. Just silence, the the ultimate silent treatment from God. And now finally, God has sent another prophet to speak on his behalf to his people. And he comes preaching a simple yet powerful message from God. One word, repent. Repent. The king is coming, get ready, repent. It's the same message that Jesus began his ministry with in Mark chapter one, verse 15. Jesus came on the scene and he says, repent and believe in the gospel, repent. And I know that's a Christianese word. Like how many of you guys use the word repent this week? Probably none of you. Not like in normal conversations. Like, what, what, what does this word repent mean? I wanna show you kind of a, what I believe is a full definition of the word repent and then we'll dig into a little bit. I'll show it to you on the side screen so you can take a picture. Repent means to reconsider. To have a change of self, heart and mind that abandons former dispositions and results in a new self with new behavior and regret over former behavior and dispositions. There's a full definition of what it means to repent. And and what you need to understand is that repentance, first and foremost, starts in your mind. I I think sometimes we think, oh, repent, that means that I I turn from living one way and I, I start living another. Absolutely, but it starts in the mind. It starts with thinking differently. For those of you that are in the room that know Jesus, and you can remember when you first came to know him, you started thinking differently, didn't you? Didn't you? I mean, I can, I've shared a story with you before. Like, I get saved, and I continue to go out, like, to the clubs and stuff every weekend thinking, like, that it's still okay. And I'm all inebriated there, and I'm telling people, you got to come to church with me. And eventually, I'm like, this doesn't feel right anymore. The, the, the things that I used to do, I didn't want to do anymore. The, the way that I used to talk, I'm like, that doesn't feel right anymore. I don't think I should be speaking like that. The, I once thought it was okay, but now I'm like, nah, I don't think the same way about those things. Now I see that those things and those motives and those actions, they're, they're wrong. It starts in the mind, but then it has to, it has to find its way to your heart. Where you begin to feel sorrow It's not just realizing that something is sin, it's now having sorrow over that sin. And not just that it is sin, but it's against God. You guys know the story of Joseph? Yeah? So Joseph had a really rough life and he finds himself finally like in this place where it's kind of gotten a little better. I mean, he's serving in this guy's house as, as his servant. But he's got all this authority. Now, Joseph at this time is a young man. He's like a model. He's shredded. He's jacked. And, and you've got to assume J- the Potiphar's wife, the guy that he's working for, has to be a beautiful woman. And she's watching him every day, lusting after him, saying to him, lie with me. Lie. Now, imagine a young man, hormones raging, Handsome dude, has had a hard life. Like, hey, maybe this is God's gift to me. Like, I don't know. I, but, but as he's presented with her one day as she comes to him, and she's like, lie with me. What he says is so interesting. He says, how could I do this thing and sin against God? Certainly it would have been a sin against his boss, certainly. But his heart said, don't do this against God. You see, repentance starts in your mind where you start to see things in a different way, but it makes its way to your heart where you begin to feel differently about those sins, and eventually it makes its way to your hands where there's a change of living. But repentance, brothers and sisters, cannot skip the heart. I'll show you a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'll show it to you in the Amplified Version. It says this about where does real repentance come from? For godly sorrow that is in accord with the will of God, it produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But worldly sorrow, the hopeless sorrow of those who do not believe, produces death. What is he saying there? Where does real repentance come from? Real repentance 
comes from a godly sorrow, a sorrow over, I can't believe what I did was against God. I can't believe the thing that I just did is something that Jesus hung on the cross for. And the Bible says that kind of sorrow leads to repentance, not regret. Now, there's a worldly kind of sorrow that says, oh, I can't believe I got caught. Or, oh, I can't believe now I have to suffer the consequences of this. And, and God has nothing to do with that kind of sorrow. That sorrow is completely me-focused. He says, that's not real repentance. Real repentance comes from a godly sorrow that is broken over our sin that is against God and leads us away from our sin. Again, it is turning. It is turning away from our sin and turning to who, church? God, to Jesus. Gosh, John, why so urgent with this message? Repent, for the king is coming. And he says this, the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the first of 32 times in the book of Matthew you see this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. I would encourage you, if you have a paper Bible, underline it, circle it. It's important because Matthew is seeking to present Jesus as the king. And as Jesus comes near, the king of kings, he brings with him the kingdom of heaven. And what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, certainly it is a place where the rule and reign of God is there. And it is marked by righteousness and peace and justice and love. That is one part of it. It is a very good thing. But it is also marked by judgment and righteous wrath on sin. That's why John is so urgent. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is coming. And for most of us, we'd be like, that's great, I'm so glad. Why are you freaking out, John? He, because with the kingdom of heaven also comes judgment on our sin. So if there's sin, you have to repent. And you're like, man, this is a really rough first message for the new year. I brought a friend, why are you talking like this? Guys, this is... So important, and this is why John is so like, repent, because the nearer that authority gets, the more serious you have to take it. For those of you that speed again, right? You're looking in the rear view, that car keeps getting closer with the lights on it. The closer it gets, the more tense you get, and the more you start to obey the traffic laws. The nearer that authority gets, the more you change. And John's saying, the authority is here. The king has come. Take sin seriously and repent. And the response to the message is amazing. All the people in Jerusalem and Judea, they come out into the wilderness. They come to hear this message from this crazy man. And they begin confessing their sins in front of everyone and saying, baptize me. This is an amazing moment. And I know that many of us know this moment from the scriptures, but I gotta tell you why this is a shocking scene. Because baptizing was not a regular practice for the Jews in the Old Testament. It just wasn't. It was a regular practice for Gentiles and pagans who were outside of the Jews. The Jews were God's chosen people. But if you were a Gentile and you were looking on at the nation of Israel and you said, I wanna know your God and I wanna follow your God, they would look at you and say, you can't, you're dirty, you got sin. Is there anything I can do to kind of join you? We can baptize you. We'll baptize you and we'll wash all the dirt and the sin off of you. That way you can be part of us. You can go from being an outsider to an insider. It was not for Jews. Which makes this scene shocking. Because John is telling the Jews, God's chosen people, that just because you're Jewish, it doesn't mean that you're good with God. That's offensive. He's telling the Jews that have forever been insiders that you are outsiders. And you have to enter the kingdom just like the Gentiles. Do you see that they were like counting on their culture and on their relationships to their forefathers to get them into heaven? Do you think that still happens? I just spent two weeks in the Bible Belt. You ever been in the Bible Belt, anyone? Okay, everyone's a Christian in the Bible Belt, but they're not really Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, my granddaddy was a pastor. And they, everyone thinks they're just a, a Christian by association, and, and also, it happens differently here. I know that people come here every single week, and I'm glad that you do, but you only come because someone forces you to come. And you may even be counting on their relationship with God to make you right with God. 
And John would say, no, no, their faith can't make you right with God. I used to think that for a while when I was younger. Like, man, my mom, she's, on, she's a crazy Christian. Like, her faith's got to be good enough for me. John's like, nah, don't work like that. Romans 3.23, you know what Romans 3.23 says? For some have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, all of us are born into this world as outsiders. All of us. All of us have sinned against a perfect and holy God. Some of us already today, like 10 times, already, on the way here. All of us, we all need to be cleansed. Does that offend you? Because the kingdom is offensive. But it's the truth, and the truth always hurts before it heals. Always. I've been getting my feelings hurt a lot as I've gone to the doctor as I've gotten older. Because I go to the doctor, and I'm like, nah, I'm good for my age. Like, I'm good. And then he's like, well, here's the blood report. And then I'm offended. I'm like, how dare you? He's like, no, but the truth is right here in the numbers. Oh, I don't want to see that. I'm healthy. Do you see how silly that would be? But the truth always hurts before it heals. And the truth is that we are all sinners and all need to be cleansed. But the only problem is that we can't clean ourselves there's only one person that can make us clean, and what is his name? Jesus. And that's, you got to remember, repentance turns you not just away from your sin to be a better person. It turns you away from your sin and turns you to Jesus, the only one who can make you right with the Father. Get ready for the king. Repent from your sins. This is where a relationship with Jesus begins coming to the realization that you need to repent. That's where it starts, but you have to know that's also how it continues. You guys ever heard of a guy named Martin Luther? Yes? He had 95 theses, and the first one he said this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. As Christians, our entire lives should be marked by repentance. David Mathis, in reference to this, said this, all of the Christian life is repentance. Turning from sin, trusting in the good news that Jesus saves sinners isn't merely a one-time inaugural experience, but it is the daily substance of Christianity. The gospel is for every day and every moment. Repentance is to be the Christian's continual posture. So you may be sitting in here and be like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, 25 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord and I repented. Great, I love it, awesome. But is, any, is anyone in here perfect? So do you, do you see the reality and the truth that our lives should be ones of continual repentance? This has been a very difficult study for me this week as I've, I've asked God, God, show me. And he showed me something and I'm like, I can't believe that I've gotten comfortable with that. I can't believe that I've let that linger in my life and I don't even, I don't even feel sorrow over it anymore. Yeah, sure, I'll just, I'll just say, the Lord, that was wrong, forgive me for that. But I've lost that godly sorrow and I had to pray, God, please, in Jesus' name, grant me a godly sorrow that would lead to repentance in this area of my life. When is the last time you kind of, went before the Father in that way. As you look ahead into this new year, I don't want to ask you, like, man, what's your resolution? What area in your life do you need repentance? Do you know? Because none of us are perfect, and we all have some area. Maybe it's something that we've been partaking in or doing or thinking or saying or feeling or drinking or smoking And we've just gotten used to it. And it doesn't, it doesn't hit the same way anymore. We're just, ah, whatever. And we need the Father to restore to us a godly sorrow and repentance. Maybe it's not what you're doing. Maybe it's what you're not doing. Maybe there was a time when you were just on fire for Jesus and in his word every day, loving him and loving your family well. And now you just don't do that stuff anymore. And for whatever reason, you've just gotten okay with it. You don't feel it anymore. 
We need to repent. Constantly, consistently, we need to be a people of repentance. Do you agree with that? So here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to pause. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I, I'm, I want you to ask the Father to search you and to show you, is there any way within me that needs to be repented of? And just listen for his voice. And if he shows you, I want you to ask for godly sorrow and for grace to repent. Go ahead, you do that right now. Amen. Look with me at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, Well, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Stop right there. Some of us need to repent from our sin, but the second point, as the king comes near, is this, that we need to run from religion. You're like, what? You're you're a pastor, how could you say that? Well, well, we, we say this a lot here, is that Christianity is not about a religion, it's about a relationship. Religion is about mankind trying to do its best to make its way up to God to be good with God. If I could just live my life a certain way, then God will love me, that's religion. Let me work my way up to God. Jesus is God in the flesh and he came down so that we might know him. And we must run from religion because now here at this great scene of a baptism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they show up and these are the the religious folk of the day. They knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. They kept it to a T. They were the holy rollers. And they came out there not to be baptized like everyone else, but they came out to see what was going on. And John sees them. And he knows that they are like the other Jews who were not only counting on their ethnicity to make them right with God, but he knew they were counting on their own righteousness. These were a people that thought that they could be good enough to be good with God. And what does he call him? Did you see what he called them? Brood of vipers. What are vipers? Snakes. Do you think that John the Baptist knows about Genesis in the beginning and the serpent? Do you think he knows that? So what, what, in essence, what is he calling them? He's calling them children of the devil. Can you imagine if I stood up here today and called some of y'all children of the devil. Like, again, he don't care. But John, why would you say such a thing? Why? Because he knew that they were religious. And all religion is dangerous. Our attempts to make ourselves right with God is a dangerous thing. Why? Because it gives us a false sense of humility. I'm sorry, of security. So you think, I go to church, I even own a paper Bible. I was one of the people that held it up. I prayed before every meal. And and you have this checklist of self-righteousness and your goodness. And you think that because you're a good person that you are good with God. And that is a dangerous place to be. I, I don't know how many religions there are, quote unquote, across the world. But who do you think is behind all the religions of the world? The devil, because he knows how foolish would it be to try to get people to think that there is no God, but if I can get them to believe in false gods, 
Well, then they'll just kind of be lulled into this false sense of security. Yeah, yeah, I believe in God. Which God? This God, but that's not the real God, but it's my God. And John sees them coming and he says, you sons of Satan. He says, y'all need to repent just like everyone else. I know you think you're good, but you ain't good enough. He says, show me some fruit, man. I need to see evidence. You need to be baptized just like everyone else here. And my concern, and you'll hear me say this probably once a month, is for those that come here and are counting on their church attendance, their generosity, or their goodness, and those are all good things. Please don't hear me say that those are bad things, but if you're standing on those things to be right with God. I do a lot of counselings here, and there'll be times when I can just sense, I don't know if this person knows the Lord. And so I'll ask a question that most of you have probably heard before, and I, and I want you to answer this question in your head, okay? Not out loud. I said this last night like three times, and a dude still did it out loud. I'm like, bro. One day when you stand before the Lord, and we all will, and he looks at you and he says, why should I let you in heaven? Not out loud, in your head, what is your answer? Think about it. If your answer is anything but Jesus lived the life that I never could, and then died on the cross for my sins, if it is anything but that, you have built your salvation on religion. If it's I'm a good person and I go to church, I believe in God, that's religion. The king is coming near. You know, you know Jesus is coming again, right? But the... It's going to be a lion next time. It's not going to be a lamb. And, and again, John, I mean, I know he sounds harsh, but he's trying to warn them. He's telling them you can't be good enough. In fact, the Bible says this, your good works are like what to God? Filthy rags. Not that we shouldn't do good works. What he's talking about is good works that are trying to earn its way into a right standing with God. Like when God sees that, it's like a filthy rag because it's not perfect. And he's seeking to warn them. And he's telling them about the judgment to come. You see, the only thing that can save from, from judgment is repentance from sin, turning to Jesus, solely relying on him for our righteousness. This is urgent. He says the ax is already laid to the base of the tree because in those days when trees wouldn't bear fruit, the farmer would come, chop them down, and burn them in the fire. He says Jesus is coming to do just that. He's coming with his winnowing fork. Anyone have a winnowing fork at home? Okay, one of you. Anyway, so if you are someone that harvested wheat, you would bring in the wheat, and the wheat would come with some chaff, and you don't want the chaff. Chaff, though, is lighter than wheat, so when you had all the chaff and the wheat on the ground, you would take your winnowing fork and you would throw the wheat and the chaff up in the air and the wind would blow away the chaff because it was lighter and you'd, you'd have the wheat. John says Jesus is coming to do that in his church. That it, there, was, there was this one moment when Jesus' disciples were all mad because they were looking at people who were claiming to be Christians and they really weren't. And they're like, let's call down fire on them. And he's like, guys, chill out, Okay. I'm going to do that on the last day. On the last day, I'll separate the sheep from the goats and the wheat from the chaff. You don't do that because when humans try to do that, you'll end up hurting someone who's actually a real believer. But the day is coming. Judgment is coming. And you're like, man, so much judgment and fire talk. Like John would be... <laughs> seen as so offensive in today's churches to good people. But unless someone fully understands the judgment of God that is to come, they will never fully appreciate the judgment of God that Jesus took on himself so that you and I wouldn't have to. If we don't understand what is coming and what we were headed towards, we will never appreciate what Jesus did for us. 
That's why John is sitting here being so serious about judgment. The king is coming. You need to change. You need to repent. Get ready for the king. And when you stand before him, what will you stand on? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Christ alone, my cornerstone. Period. That's it. Anything else is as filthy rags. And I say this in the way that John did. If you are here today and you think that you are in right standing with God because you go to church or because you own a Bible, I, I don't want to see you separated in the, in the last day from us. If you hear his voice today, if you're saying, you know what, I think that's me, then today needs to be the day that you finally repent from your ways and run to Jesus and surrender your life to him. Because the king is coming. Is, isn't, isn't it closer now today than it was then? So isn't it more urgent now? And you might think, man, why are you like, can you imagine if there was like a bridge over a, a valley and it, it was like broken in the middle? But people couldn't see it, but you knew it was there. And if they drove over that valley, like they would just certain doom. And you stood at the front of that bridge and you're trying to warn people. How would you warn people as they were driving by? Hey, can I get a second of your time? Oh, oh okay, okay, all right. Hey, can I, can I tell you about something? You would be making a fool of yourself. Stop! This is what John is doing. Run from religion. And then something crazy happens and someone shows up to be baptized that you would never expect that would show up to be baptized. It's Jesus. Look at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The last point of how do we get ready for the king and how can we see real change in our life? We must remember our identity. We must remember our identity. What was it like for John in that moment, baptizing all these people, next, and then he looks up and it's Jesus. I can remember when I first taught like in Fort Lauderdale and, and looking out in the crowd and seeing some of the pastors that like had been my teachers for so long, I was like petrified. This is Jesus. And so John is like, whoa, um, what are you doing here? I'm here to be baptized by you. <laughs> I think you need to baptize me. And he's like, no, no, no. Probably won't understand this, but, but we need to do this now. It's, it's righteous. It's good. And he consents. And, and why is John so, like, so shocked? It's because he knows that his baptism is for the repentance and cleansing of sins. That's what John's baptism was for. Did Jesus have sin? No reason to repent. John knew this because we know from John's gospel that when John sees Jesus coming, he says what? Behold, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. John knows the sacrificial system, knows that the sacrifice must be perfect. He knows that Jesus is a whole different kind of perfect. So this doesn't make sense in his mind. Why are you coming to me? And he baptizes him. And it's such a cool moment because you see all three members of the Trinity, Jesus being baptized, the Spirit coming down, the Father speaking. But why did Jesus get baptized? I mean, if he didn't need it for the repentance of sins, what was, the, what was the point? Well, as so much of his ministry was focused on, he did it to identify with us. And when you're going to identify with mankind, you must identify with sin because we all have sin. 
And so much of what Jesus did was in our place. So fast forward a few years, it's not baptism, but it's the cross. And he hung on the cross, not for his sins, but for ours, taking our place. Consider, this is the first act of his public ministry, and he's identifying with us through baptism for the forgiveness of sins. He, he, he didn't go to John and be like, hey, bro, um, cuz, what's up? Can we do like a little private baptism at your house? Because I don't want other people to think I'm a sinner. He's like, let's just do that in front of everybody. Because I've come to identify with you, to take your place so that you could be reconciled to the Father. And this is why Jesus came to be baptized. It's also an example for us of what to do, modeling it for us. He says, this is a righteous thing. Now today, our baptism as Christians is different. John's baptism was for washing and cleansing of sin. Today, when we get baptized, we are identifying with Jesus. So when we go under the water as Christians, we're identifying with his death. I'm dying to myself. I'm no longer gonna live that way. And when we come up out of the water, we're saying, this is a new life and I now live for Jesus. And brothers and sisters, if you are a follower of Jesus, there should be a moment in your life where you have been baptized after you become a Christian. I told you before my story as a little baby, the little white robes and everything, and they brought me to a church and some dude poured water on my head and I'm screaming. That was not a great experience for me. I had no idea what was going on. But for us today, it is, it is this moment where we get to say, I belong to Jesus out in front of everyone. It's, a, it's an outward symbol of the inward reality of our relationship with him, very much like a wedding ring. And if you've never been baptized before, our next baptism is on Saturday, February 10th. I hope that you would join us for that. But here is Jesus, baptized. The Spirit descends upon him like a dove. It is a picture of Isaiah 61, verse 1, if you want to write it down for reference. And it says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Again, this could have all happened in private. God's like, I want everyone to see this and to know this. The incarnation, Jesus, fully man, fully God, a mystery. But in this moment, the spirit descends upon him to set him apart and to anoint him for the ministry that he was about to walk in. It's very important. Father then speaks one of only three times in the New Testament that the Father speaks. Do you think it's important if God the Father only speaks three times in the New Testament, do you think we should pay attention to what he says when he speaks? And this is the first time he speaks in the New Testament. And what does he say? This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. There was no other Old Testament sacrifice that pleased the Father. It did its job, it covered sin for a little bit, but again, when Jesus came on the scene, he is the Lamb of God who came not to cover our sin, but to take it away. And so all can hear, he looks at Jesus and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why? How does this scene in this moment of Jesus' baptism help us remember our identity? When we become Christians, we are united to Jesus. We are in Christ that is extremely important because that means that when God the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your mess and your sins and your mistakes. Who does he see? Jesus. Has Jesus ever sinned? No. Like, let, let this wash over you afresh maybe because if this doesn't move you and this is just head knowledge, we really need a fresh wind. Because there's some days when I can't believe that when the Father looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. And it's only because of Jesus. And it's in those moments when I need to be reminded that no matter how many mistakes I made or how many times I've blown it, how many times I've failed to live under the authority of my king, that even then he looks at me and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You will never be able to live in the kingdom for our king without reminding yourself of your identity as a son or daughter every single day. That regardless of who you are or what you've done or the mistakes that you've made, God's love for you is perfect and immovable. 
He, he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Just think about that for a second. How much does the Father love Jesus? And he loves you just like that. There is nothing you could do to increase his love for you. There's nothing that you have failed to do that would make him love you less. Isn't that good news? That when the God of the universe looks at us, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And not because of anything you did, but because of what Jesus did. And also because you are in Christ Now the same power that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you. The Holy Spirit, not just any kind of spirit, the Holy Spirit. Holy? You see, in the Old Testament, it was God's holiness that didn't allow him to come close because we would be consumed. But now that we are in Christ and made perfect in him, now his spirit lives inside of us. So the very same power that Jesus was walking in on his time in the earth, now we walk in as well. Now, I'm not saying you can go walk on water and feed 5,000 people with some bread. But there is a power that is available to you to live in a way that is different. And I think we know that, but I don't know that we walk in that. It's why Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. Father, please help them to know and understand the greatness of your power that works towards them who believe the same power that raised Christ from the dead. This is our identity, guys. We are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Is there any greater power than that? No. And we are perfectly loved by the Father. This is who we are in Christ. And if we're gonna live in a way that is worthy of our King, if we're gonna see real change in us, in our communities, in our cities, we must remember who we are. Because we will fail, and and when we fail, we are prone to forget. We're prone to forget these things. And so I wanna close our time by having you close your eyes for a second, and maybe you've never done this before. But I want you to personalize the words of the Father to Jesus to yourself this morning. And I want you to imagine a moment where the Father is looking at you, and I want you to say these words in your head that this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. And I want you to think about those words. Just let the Spirit speak to you in, in this moment. Father, we thank you for this great gift that we have in your son. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for living the life that we couldn't, dying the death that we deserved, so that today we could know that we have not just been forgiven, but we have been adopted. We are sons and daughters. We belong to you and nothing will ever change that. Your love, your love for us is perfect. I pray for us as a church that you would open the eyes of our hearts to know that love in deeper ways. I pray for us that we would live lives of repentance continually, allowing you to search search us and change us. We surrender to you afresh today, Father. And if there's anyone who has never even done that for the first time, I pray today, Father, that you would draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name. Hey, we're just going to pause for a moment because I, I can't end a service with that and not give anyone here an opportunity to respond by repenting. And I want you to think about the scene that happened here. These people heard the message and they left from where they were to come out into the wilderness in front of all these people. And repentance often starts with a confession a realization, an admittance, I'm wrong. It's looking at God, not at me, I'm just a man. It's looking to God and saying, I'm wrong, I have sin in my life and I know that it is an offense to you. 
And I know that I can never live in relationship with you, the one who made me, unless I am made clean. And I can't make myself clean. I can't be good enough. And, and that's why Jesus came. That's why the Lamb of God came to take away your sins, to do for you what you could never do for yourself by living a perfect life and dying on the cross and extending this gift and saying, if you want it, it's yours. You can't earn this. You gotta receive it. And you don't receive it just by coming to a building on a Sunday or knowing someone else who's a Christian. You receive it when it, when it really hits home for you. When it makes sense in your mind and it hits your heart. And you say, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want to live for God. I can't force that on anyone. I can't teach that well enough. When someone comes to know Jesus, it is a complete work of God. And so they're going to play a song right now. And when they play this song, I want to give any of you that are here an opportunity that need to repent and turn to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you have wandered and strayed and you need to give your life back to the king today. We're going to be praying. And if that's you, no matter where you're at, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and like all of those Jews did, leave their home, leave your home seat and come and stand here at the foot of this altar. And when the song ends, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance and surrender to Jesus. Whoever you are, no matter how far you feel from God, no matter how good you think you are, even apart from God, we all need Jesus, and he has made himself available to us. But you have to make a choice. And so church, those of you that do know him, I'm asking as always that you would be in serious prayer in this moment because there is a spiritual battle happening right now in someone's heart where the enemy is trying to keep them blind to this, keep them in their seat, keep them far from God. But we know that our God is greater. And so pray that eyes would be opened. But listen, please, the kingdom is coming and Jesus is coming back. And on that day, every knee will bow some by force and at that point it will be too late today if you hear his voice do not harden your heart if you know you need to get right with God today if you know you need to surrender with him when this song starts come forward and I will pray that prayer with you church please be in prayer for anyone that needs to do that but if that's you as this song plays come Here's what we're going to do right now. We are first and foremost, we're going to pray over you. And after we pray over you, um, I'm going to give you some words to pray out loud. But I, I don't want you just to, like, repeat them without thinking. I want you to think about the words, and I want you to think about who you're saying it to. And all the time, I want you to remember that God loves you so much, he sent his son to die to make this moment possible. And rejoice in that. This is a happy moment. This is why we applaud. It's why we clap. And so church, where you're at, if you guys would extend a hand over everyone that's here, I'm going to pray for you and then I'll lead you in that prayer. Father, thank you so much. 
Thank you for your kingdom that is good and right and perfect. It's filled with peace and justice and love. Thank you that you sent your son to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Thank you for the way that you pursue us and you love us and Lord, you lived and you died for us so that we might be forgiven and adopted and know you. And I thank you for every person that stands here now before this altar. I thank you for the godly sorrow that you've placed in their heart that has led to repentance. I thank you for what you're about to do in their lives, Lord, right now, just through this prayer of surrender. Thank you, Father. I pray that, Lord, their faith would be strengthened. They would truly believe and know in their hearts that their sins have been forgiven, that the old things have passed away, and all things will be made new in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making those things possible. May they leave here today knowing they are loved and they belong to you and that that could never change because Jesus is the one who paid for it, not them. Open their eyes to these things and pray this in your name. And for those of you that are here, I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me to God. Say, Lord God, I admit that I've sinned and I need Jesus. I believe that he's my God and I believe that he's my savior. So today I surrender. I give him my life. And from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So guys, uh, as I said in the beginning, this, this is the beginning. This is a journey of following Jesus. And we just want to get you guys started off on the right foot and give you a Bible if you don't have one. And I just want to say a couple more words to you. So if you see Pastor Mike standing right there, if you guys could follow him for just one quick second, I'll be right behind you, and then you guys can get right back to your family and friends. Church, you can give them a hand as they go. Guys, would you all stand with me as we leave with one last song of worship? Hope to see you tonight, 6 p.m. for our night of prayer. Again, questions on anything that I mentioned for the 77 announcements, you can get answered out there. Love you guys. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin.
Amen. Thank you, church, for being with us. We love you guys so much, and we'll see you next week.